So it's, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, and, uh, you know, thanks for the organizers, especially Evan, who uh, invited me here. And obviously, it's an honor to have uh, Professor Clouseau introduce me. I mean, he's obviously a legend of this community. So uh, what I am going to do today is I was not sure how, much of you, how many of you know this whole concept of adversarial examples. So I was going to, the first half of the talk uh, is going to be sort of just introducing that. And the second half of the talk uh, is more sort of uh, formal methods PL uh, style work that I've been doing with Tommaso Drosio who was a postdoc of Sanjit Sesha at Berkeley. Um, and a lot of this work, and we're still continuing to do a lot of work. Uh, Tommaso has gone into the black hole of uh, industry, so I don't talk to him anymore. But uh, Sanjit uh, and his group I talk to quite a bit. So one thing I just wanted to say is that I have more slides than I can cover. So I'll be skipping around a lot. And I think if it doesn't breach the protocol, I would say that please ask questions as the talk is going on. Please don't wait for the end. It, it keeps it more lively, and uh, you know, just, just uh, it just keeps it more lively. So the, the thing which I is that in this, so I have a Latin squad, and this, whenever you see the Rubik's cube, it's probably a good opportunity for formal methods folks to jump in. And one of my the sort of goal for this talk is that some of you might get interested in this field and sort of jump in and we'll, we need as many people as possible to work on this. So hopefully we will, uh, you know, some of you will be inspired by this. Okay, so this I, I should probably take this out. Machine learning is doing everything, okay? Pretty soon probably these conferences will be run by machine learning. So I'm not going to sort of belabor on this. Remember this, you know, you have to probably motivate it many years back, but not anymore. Um, so this is where our story is going to start. Uh, 2013 is when, if you remember, there were a lot of, uh, I don't know, stories coming out that machine learning is beating humans at a lot of tasks. Okay? Like recognizing objects and faces, it was doing better than actually almost humans, breaking captures, um, and it was doing better than actually human performance. Okay. And um, this is uh, more a dig for my uh, parents. My parents wanted me to be a real doctor or a fake doctor. Uh, and uh, so I, I actually sent them this slide. To, and now in certain tasks, like radiology and other things, it's actually beating doctors. So this is more a dig at my parents who still don't think I'm a real doctor. It's, uh, they wanted me to, to be a real medical doctor. And um, machine learning is obviously deployed in a lot of adversarial settings. Uh, for example, uh, there is this tweet bot from uh, Microsoft where if you give it some poison data, it starts tweeting offensive things. Uh, maybe offensive to us, but actually our president does that all the time. So I, I don't know whether he doesn't mean any data poison. So I think it, it starts doing some, some, some crazy things. It is used in sort of self-driving cars where there might be uh, sort of an adversary trying to tamper, or uh, like YouTube filtering can be very easily uh, sort of bypassed. One of the best examples I saw was from Stanford, Dan Bonet's group. So have you guys seen that these ad, uh, where this, these ad blockers on your sort of websites where they say, oh, this is the ad blocker, they can actually change it very little And actually, he, he told me that he's actually getting death threats from those companies. So believe it or not. Uh, and ML is used a lot in cyber physical systems where obviously you don't want uh, adversaries to be able to tamper. OK, so here is what we begin. So uh, whenever a security person uh, sees this, and this is a slide that I got from Ian Goodfellow. So if you look at all the machine learning Well, 
this is fine to do a lot of theory and lot, write a lot of papers, but in real life, the person who doesn't care whether it's high or low or not, and it can draw from any distribution, and that's where it all began. So, for example, this is a straw size that was created by a team from Michigan and Berkeley, um, and it was by most object detectors, it was actually classified as a 45 limit. modern art now. That st physical stop sign that they created in Michigan is in uh, London uh, Museum of Art. Okay, so one thing I wanted to say is that adversarial learning is not new. So in terms of, it had been studied quite a bit uh, by Lau and me in 2005 and in, in the context of spam detection. I mean, you must have, I don't know whether you have seen some, sometimes they get a spam with like Shakespeare quotes and other they're just trying to test the machine learning spam detection. But this uh, sort of, uh, you know, DNNs ruling the world, it has taken a new life. So I just wanted to say this, that it is actually not new. Okay, so here is sort of like, let's get into what adversarial machine learning is. So this is my mock-up of a machine learning pipeline. You take training data. You run your best uh, learning algorithm. You get your parameters. Think about like think about like weights of the DNN, and then you put a test input saying, "Hey, is this a stop sign?" And you get a prediction. And each stage of this pipeline has been attacked by security uh, uh, researchers. And so, what I'm going to do is before I get into each of them. Um, I'm just going to just put some notation down, and probably you guys know all of this, just so that we have consistency by notation. So I'm going to be describing everything in a supervised learning setting, where you have a sample space. X is your data, so think about images. Y is labels. This is a cat, this is a dog. Uh, and we have some distribution over these, the sample space. And we have a hypothesis space from which we are trying to learn, like weight of the DNA. And we have a loss function, which basically says, how do we penalize when we make mistakes? So think about like that, something to fight with. So for example, you know, a zero one loss says, if you it's a cat and you predict it's a dog, then you get a one, otherwise you get a zero. And the goal is always to minimize the expected loss over a data set that you draw from. Forget the regularizer term for now. Uh, okay, so all you need to know for this talk is that the way to solve this minimization problem is this simple stochastic gradient descent. There are many versions where you take a weight at your previous time step and you update it using this formula. That's all. Okay, for this talk, there are all lots of other versions of this. And the only thing you need to remember is you take the old way and you take, this is called a learning way. You take a step in the direction of the negative of the gradient of the loss function. That's, that's all you need to know. Don't, don't sort of over, sort of think that too much. And that's all you need to know, that in order to minimize these things, you're taking a step in the direction of the negative of the loss function. By the way, you don't see all this because TensorFlow just kind of does it for you or TensorFlow or Scikit, whatever you're using, just does it for you, but that's what we're gonna do. And after training, you have a classifier which says, oh, this might be images, what are your labels? And sort of that's all we need to know. Good. Okay, training time attacks. So training time attack is that you have your training data and evidence comes in and poisons a few data, put some stuff in there so that you learn something very different from what you would have learned. 
Okay? So my favorite example comes from uh, Professor Jerry Zhu, who's at the University of Wisconsin. Um, uh, Wisconsin gets very cold, and we track the number of ice days per year throughout. Can anybody guess why did you try to do this? It makes us feel very bad because <laughs> but, you, know, you can see the number of ice days. Why did you try to track this? So did you track it quite a bit, actually. So like climate change or, or so on, and they basically, what you would expect that um, You can see it over here. But let's say you're a climate denier, and uh, you get into my computer, and you change the points a little bit so that the slope goes up. Okay, so this would be a classic data poisoning attack. And the basic point here is that under reasonable norms, you don't have to change the points too much to sort of make the thing go up and say, hey, all these uh, scientists are crazy. And here's a basically the formalization. You, Alice picks a point S of size M. Alice is the good person. Alice gives the data set to Bob. Bob picks some fraction of the points, so maybe epsilon is 10%, and gives and puts some bad points and gives it back to Alice. And goal of Bob is to maximize the error for Alice, and goal of Alice is to get close, as close to learning to so this field is not new. Uh, this field is connect, uh, what is known as robot statistics. And it's, it's a very old field. And uh, Peter Huber from Berkeley kind of is a big uh, person in this area. But if you're interested in this, we are not going to spend too much time. There's recently, there's just uh, by more, um, what is that, volume A guy. Thing where they're able to match lower bounds and so on, and here are some of the papers. We're not going to get into that too much. Okay, the other is model extraction. So what is the big promise of the cloud, right? The cloud is you put your, uh, Evan trains a machine learning model using some proprietary data set, puts the model up in the cloud, and then I query it, and he gets some money for the data. So this is called machine learning. Selling this, like you know, you, you know, like Google and all those guys are trying to say, oh, you know, you put your machine learning thing in the cloud and you just use per query, uh, sort of some some pricing model. Okay, so what model have said is that can I interact with this model in a black box manner and actually just extract the model? So then the whole business. And at least, so the, the formalization here is you are given a classifier F, you query F on some points, and you learn a classifier that's pretty close to what's in the cloud. Okay? And essentially, this field is not new. This is called active learning in machine learning. And using some of those techniques, so this is uh, the original paper. From some of the Cornell Tech folks, and it was in Usenix Security, and we have a paper coming up in Usenix Security 2000. Uh, this the next year, which is improving on that. And essentially, the, the point here is that under the current pricing model, within 50, 60 bucks, I can extract your DNA with uh, complete. Okay, so the idea is that I don't know. So I don't know or do something. And so this is a big open area. I, we, we don't know how to defend against this attack. And um, I was at a conference where the keynote was given by uh, Jeff Dean from Google. And he said this is the big thing we've got to do, actually, in model extraction. OK, good. Now, there are some attacks that I don't know how to actually, they are not really attacks. So. There are, I don't know whether you guys have seen, there are ways to generate fake data. So like Evan saying something bad about me, Obama saying something bad about somebody, where uh, you know you don't you can just
just train again to do it. So for example, I'll just play a little bit uh, and, and then we'll, we'll, this was generated automatically by a GAN. So the idea here is that with fake, these fake videos, you can then imagine that if I have a GAN that trains this, I can then start doing a tweet storm of this. And uh, you know, I mean, it's very cheap. So this, this, this was created by University of Washington folks, but this is easy enough that, I mean, I, I, it, was a, it was a project in my graduate class. And they did much better than this. Okay, so this is just um, quite sort of trivial. Now we actually come up to adversarial examples. So uh, adversarial examples are inputs to machine learning models that an attacker has intentionally designed to cause the model to behave. Okay. So for example, that stop sign uh, monstrosity. So the first adversarial example was, uh, there are a lot of original papers that came in. So for example, everybody probably agrees this is a panda. I hope so. And I can add some noise to it so that most state-of-the-art DNA models start saying that it's a good thing. So 93% probability, 99.3% probability. There are attacks on NLP systems where I can take a Yelp review, change a couple of words. So everything, this is what an adversarial example is, that I would perturb in a very clever manner so that it totally throws your model off. And you, there are galleries of this. If you are ever bored at an airport, you can start looking. School bus goes to ostrich. And this is my favorite because my wife is into making guacamole a lot these days. I don't know. she's. <laughs> She's obsessed with avocados. Uh, so uh, this is an 88% tabby cat becomes 99% guacamole. Um, now this is very interesting. This is a video that they made something called an adversarial turtle, the MIT guy, where most models start saying it's actually, doesn't matter in what manner you see the turtle, you can turn it and most mo models start saying it's a rifle. And that's why they, they, they call this uh, video, Don't Bring Your Turtle to a Gunfight. Um, so, uh, so there are these, all these kind of things uh, going on. So, uh, and it's gone beyond deep learning. So you have uh, every kind of machine learning model has been attacked, and you can easily create adversarial examples. So what is the definition here? So a formal definition of this would be, I mean, done as follows. You have an oracle, think about a human oracle, um, that basically says when two points are perceived as the same by a human being. Let's say you have that oracle. By the way, does anybody recognize that picture? It's the oracle from the Matrix movie. Okay, that's one of my, uh, the only thing I'm going to I'll put some movie, movie references as they're going on. So the targeted local robustness says that if two points are perceived the same, then they should not have some target. So for example, if you take two points at, and they're modeled as stop sign, then they should, the classifier should not say that it's a uh, yield sign. So that is what is called a targeted local robustness. Um, and Essentially, uh, untargeted basically says that if two things are perceived as same by the oracle, then the classifier should also say that it's the same. If two human beings say they have the same image, then the classifier should say they have the same image. 
And then you can define a global robustness by just taking the expectation over that predicate. And essentially, the way I think about it, because I guess my PhD was in model checking, then all adversarial examples are counter examples to self correction. That's it. OK? Now, the, the problem is. So what do actual researchers use? They approximate this oracle by some norms, L infinity, L1, LP, saying, oh, if X and X prime are similar in the norm, then we say the oracle is true. But this is actually a huge thing that is happening in the community. People are, are now attacking, saying, hey, this is not right. The real human perception doesn't work like that. For example, if I take a cat, right, and I blur the I think this is, but the, you know, the way I think about this is, um, like, we try to, in model testing and formal methods, we try to have a logic that, you know, sort of organizes everything. Optimization is the logic of machine learning. So if they, they, have, they make assumptions so they can throw the optimization hammer at the user. And this one, you can do that. Um, the, for, for, from a threat model point of view, you, there is a lot of, you can either have a white box access, like the, the attacker knows everything about the type of cat, right? weights, everything, or you have a black box uh, sort of attack where you only get weights. So, you know, there is a lot, of, and there is a lot of gray box in between. Okay, so the first attack that came out, this was the first one that came out, and this was the one that was. Evan will not be needed. Right? Uh, so this paper came out saying, hey, let's wait a minute here. There's something weird going on here. And that these things are not learning what humans are. So they didn't even call it actually adversarial examples. And uh, this is all they do. So think about what you're going to do. So in the SPD step, you take a step in the direction of the negative of the gradient of the mass function, right? I showed you that. So as an attacker, what are you going to do? You're going to do the opposite. I'm going to take a step in the positive direction of the gradient of the mass function. And that's all these guys do. So this is basically sine of the gradient of the mass function, and you just multiply it by some hyperparameter epsilon. So, and you just add it to things. That's it. Okay? You cannot get to further than that, right? You take the gradient of the mass function that is positive, you do a plus one. Negative minus one, and you multiply the whole thing by epsilon, and you add it to that image. And they found that they were breaking all the state of the art machine learning models. This is this is stunning, right? I mean, this is if you like, I think if you are teaching an undergrad class on machine learning, this is literally going to be like two lines per paper per day. Maybe less, maybe one. You can do it in one. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> now. Um, the problem here is that uh, if I apply this multiple times, then I can get outside the epsilon box, right? If I do it each time, then I will be further away from the example. And you still want to be in that epsilon ball around the example. So uh, Alex Madri from MIT has this attack, which is widely known as the most powerful attack in the literature. What you do is you run your SM attack and then you project it down to the epsilon ball there so that you can do that down. So this is called projected gradient descent. And this is, if you're going to write a paper
safer in this, you have to at least run your attack on this, your defense. Okay, so um, here, in all these attacks right now, there was no control over what the target was going to be. A cat might become a guacamole, but it might become a sauce or a dog or whatever. It just changes the label, so, but you have no control over the label. We've targeted this one, what you want to do is you want to say that I want to take a stop sign and make it look like an engine sign. You have a target label that you want to do. So, uh, we were the first ones, sort of, we did that, and essentially it's very simple. Uh, what it basically does is it changes pixels one at a time, so that you get closer to the target that you want. So if you, if you know optimization, this is basically just a coordinate descent over the pixels, and um, what you can do is you can just sort of do it iteratively, and this was the first targeted attack, and now the literature has just completely blown up. Uh, in targeted case, one of the best attacks is if you're going to be in this space, it's called by Asala, Asalai, Kadrini, and Wagner. Um, okay, so the idea is now, um, imagine Tesla. What is most interesting, and this was our paper that first did this. Um, by the way, um, Nicola Peperno is the one who's responsible for me to getting into this sort of field. And you know, I, I sort of like, I think it was he who introduced me to, to a lot. So a lot of my early papers started with uh, Nicola Peperno. Um, and he's at University of Toronto now. He's a faculty there. So the idea is dead simple. So imagine, remember, we only have black box access to these things. You can only ask for labels. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a substitute network. I say, hey, this is an image recognition task. I just take some architecture, like a CNN architecture. And then I iteratively train it by asking labels from the model. And what it turns out that once I have trained a substitute uh, network, I can run my white box attack on it, like FGSM, and it turns out that those, those adversarial examples transfer. So adversarial example on substitute network is also an adversarial example on your own box. And I think the, the math behind it, um, Florian Trema from Stanford has a very nice paper where he basically says that adversarial examples lie on a very high dimensional space. And so it's very almost easy to find. So, and that's what sort of happened. And this was the first black box attack. So you did like the model check? We did model check where the model is very geared towards just generating adversarial examples. Is the classification accuracy at that too low? But think about this way, right? If I want to do adversarial examples, all I need to know are the class rules. Other stuff doesn't matter. So that's what it's happened. But uh, now there are, like this is, there is competitions. You can actually submit your black box model, attack model, and you will run against others, and there's like $10,000 competition type of competition. So, so um, what the uh, new black box attacks, uh, what they do is they use something called gradient-free optimization. So there is a way to do, so, so think about this way. If I tell you how to estimate the gradient, by just looking at the label, if there was a magic box out there, then I can run my FGD or run any optimization on it. So that's what gradient free optimization is. And this is a big field apparently in optimization. There's a very nice book by Nesterov on, on this topic. And so that's what these kind of do. To my knowledge, uh, this is the best black box attack out there. Uh, there is a, uh, just recently, by the way, one thing I wanted to say is by the time the talk is done, the papers are probably not current. There's like uh, papers on archive for 20, 30 a week almost in this topic. So when I say something that this is the best, it's 
probably not true by the time FM is over. So this is the best that I know, but somebody, I just, uh, a student of mine told me that Michael Jordan from Berkeley has another one called Hop, Skip, Jump, Tag, uh, which is better than this. So this is something I was talking to Ken McMillan at CAB last year. This is something uh, I have wondered about in formal medical history. There are, there is work that uses black box learning of L sums and all that to sort of extract a model and then you can model check or check it and so forth. There's a lot of work around that idea. These are and uh, these are much more powerful black box systems. Okay? They work with things like DNS with L star and all those things. So I have wondered whether this these these techniques can be used in that sense. Okay, defense, uh, we don't know much here, I'll be honest, and let me give you sort of evidence for that. Uh, ICLR is a conference that happens three, four months before I go out. There was a paper by Akhale, Karini, and Wagner that broke seven out of eight best paper award at ICML. So the point here is we don't know what works as a defense yet. So this is something very ripe uh, for uh, people to work on. Um, so because of this, there is this push in the community towards something called certified defenses. And certified defense basically is that you say that this is a cap, along with that you give me a certificate that in an epsilon ball the label doesn't work. Okay? Now it is one way, it sounds but not sort of complete in some way, because there might the point might still be robust, but I was just not able to generate a robust certificate. So there's a lot of push in this community to go towards what is called certified defenses. If you're interested, this is kind of the very nice paper on this topic. Um, by the way, there is a huge work now um, going on in verifying DNS. Uh, I don't know whether you can this these days here in PLDI, Popol. Uh, I, I saw one which was similar here as well. Uh, the first paper, and essentially what it is, is all these are trying to kind of, in some way, trying to certify this property. Given a classifier and a point, is it locally robust at that point? So modulo some changes, these are what they are trying to verify. So this is the property they're trying to verify. <coughs> the first paper that I know was by uh, <coughs> David Dill and these guys at CAV in 17, which was improved in ICML 2018 by those guys. Um, and there's a lot of work going on in this space. Um, so we'll, we'll come to that uh, sort of later. Okay, coming back to the defenses. <coughs> there was one defense that seven out of eight that were not working by Akalai, Karim, and Okay, and that is based on a technique from robust optimization. And the idea is actually very simple. So remember what we wanted to do initially is to minimize the expected loss, right? Now what I'll do is I will take, whenever I have a point X, I will draw an epsilon ball around it and take the maximum loss and minimize the max loss. Now what does that do? It basically is saying that whenever I have a point X, I draw a ball around it, so I'm minimizing the max, then hopefully the variation of the class <coughs> 
John Ducci. So if you guys are interested, this was a defense that was not broken. And the idea is very simple. What you do is, for each data point XR, I run the best attack out there, like the BGP attack. And instead of running my SBG stuff in XR, I run it on the attack XR, on the behavior training. And um, I, I sort of, very, if you look from very far off, it's like almost an example that is defining it in some way. You can think about these adversary examples as counterexamples, and I'm using this to kind of define my model. This was not broken. Um, <coughs> since this is a crowd that is more theoretical, there are, we don't understand theoretically what's going on at all. So this is, again, an area where uh, sort of you can uh, make a lot of dent here. So there are some lower bound results which basically say, oh, you, you can't, you, you can't uh, have robustness and accuracy at the same time. Um, by the way, um, I'm not kidding, these three, three are brothers, so they, they actually have a paper together, which I think is, I, I've never seen that, but uh, these all three are brothers. Um, and so we have some work going on is, maybe the idea is that if you have many more samples, so suppose you can get 99% accuracy with 30,000 samples, but let's say you had a billion samples, maybe the model gets robust. So there is some work that is suggesting that, there is some work which basically says that, hey, suppose I run my model for 10,000 for 10, steps, but now I run it for a billion steps. Maybe it gets robust. So it's maybe about computational complexity. There is some work suggesting that, but as I said, we don't know. So some work that I have been doing is very interesting on, on this topic. So um, if you were in, if you were doing any cryptography, the adversarial model is not information theory. You, you limit your adversarial model to what is called probabilistic polynomial attack. If you can break my encryption system in exponential time in the T side, I don't care. Because I'll be dead. And a lot of us will be gone. You can break my encryption system in 60 years. I don't care about that. That's why in cryptography they use something called probabilistic polynomial attack. And in this whole adversarial setting, the adversarial model is information theoretical. So there is some work that we have been doing which shows that if you, again, are able to limit the adversarial model to probabilistic polynomial time, maybe you can get robustness better. And I'm not going to talk about that, but it's very interesting. So again, um, this is a formal definition we've put. There is a lot of work going on in verification, analysis, and testing of DNNs that is related. So, as I told you, there's, it's basically a decision procedure which, given a classifier of points, there is a value of the loss in an epsilon ball around that. So, uh, there was a, there was, the, I think this was the first work, please correct me if I'm wrong, in, that appeared in CAB 17. The Scott, Barrett, and David Dale, and some students. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of work going on, for example, uh, for this community, there's an abstract interpretation of neural networks by uh, Vetex group that was an open 2018. Uh, they, this has been improved by issue Linux group and this was in PLGI 2018. So what I'm saying is there is a lot of work going on in the verification community. Somehow, I have always wondered is, in some sense, I told you adversarial training was like, for example, back to refinement. And can these verification engines, the decision procedures, help us with this? And people have to combine these two at all. Okay, so now comes my punchline, which is a little late. I'm trying to go further. So I gave this talk to some of the autonomous driving folks. And the problem here is all these adversarial example stuff is in a vacuum. So if you look at the intro, it says, oh, cars will crash, drones will crash, blah, 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 blah. But the thing is, has anybody shown that these adversarial examples actually do that? And the answer is no. 
It's, it's only uh, limited to the intro of the thing. And that's what we are trying to do now, say, hey, does it actually screw up your system, the control? These are just the examples. And if you want to uh, read, so this is what we are trying to do is, can we break the whole system's matches and generate a Mercedes example that actually screw up your entire system? And people haven't done that, and I think it's just because it's harder, right? I mean, with a Mercedes example, it's very easy to start writing papers. You take, get a data set, you get a model, you start running some things. This is much harder. So this is where what I call sort of and I'll, um, I'll be using this sort of mock-up uh, in the rest of the talk. So this is the mock-up of a control loop of uh, an automatic emergency brake system. So that is your car, which and interacts with the environment. <coughs> and then the ML object detector is said, hey, is there a car at what distance? It controls the controller. It controls the braking system of the car. Okay? So I'm just going to be using this as sort of a mock-up throughout. Okay, theme one. Until now, essentially we have been generating adversarial examples or counterexamples by just adding perturbations, right? Small perturbation units of things. Can we do more richer set of transformations? So for example, suppose you have a car image and the control loop does fine in a sunny Funny sort of environment, but when I change it to slightly cloudy, the braking system control loop starts behaving that. That's possible. So what I call semantic examples is you allow a richer set of transformations over which you search for common ground. Like uh, you know, you make the background cloudy, you make the you, know, you translate the part a little bit good words in a high rate and so on. So there is a paper by the MIT folks which says that a small rotation and translation can actually screw up a lot of DNS. Uh, and, but what we want to do is we want to do sort of a more richer set of transformations, construct a Mercedes examples that actually do much more than that, sort of make it uh, car cloudy and so on. And we have a paper now under submission with Sanjit and these guys so what we want to do is something like this. Right now we're just adding some small pixel values and all that becomes a given. What we want to do is we want to support things like this. So if you take a car, you move it across a line. Now notice that that perturbation is very large in the norm space. Right? If you look at the delta, the L2 norm of that transformation is huge. Okay, can you do this? Again, this is, you know, last few years I almost have been feeling like a graduate student uh, in this field. So what is the problem here? The problem is, remember, uh, when I'm just in the pixel space, I can write an optimization problem and then solve it. Find the minimum perturbation that screws up my platform. Most optimization algorithms require you to compute first order gradients. So you saw that in STD. So here is a very, so we just put this paper up on archive and it's in submission. There is this whole field in graphics called inverse graphics. And uh, what you basically do is you take your input. And since, uh, since I'm in a group that has a, a, some compiler folks, I call it intermediate representation, but that's not what the graphics folks call it. Uh, it kind of creates this intermediate representation of your image, like semantic map, texture map, and so on and so forth. Okay? Uh, if you ask me what is in there, I don't know. I just view it as a black box, I don't know. Um, and then you can make some changes in this IR space, like rotate this car, and it renders it for you. Okay? So, now there are a lot of inverse graphics is a big field in graphics, but we don't care about that. What we care about is that we can make perturbations in this space, semantic space, 
and this loop is so now what can I do I do my perturbations in the data space write an optimization problem and now I can actually compute the first order derivative from this new optimization and so we can generate a Mercedes example of different types we can make sort of uh, the time of the day to be afternoon, night, we can uh, rotate the car a little bit, move it further, and we can generate the Mercedes example in a semantic space rather than just adding pixels. Uh, and this is the sort of, uh, and we used essentially this in Wordscan. Is, is it clear? We are not just adding pixels, but we just we are actually doing perturbations in the semantic space, like making things cloudy, moving the car, putting a clone somewhere. But all that is differentiable, so I can find the worst case example. <clears throat> now, again, this is like more counterexample guided refinement. You can use these adversarial examples, um, and what we basically want to do is this. So, what happens is, as we generate these adversarial examples, a lot of them, so for example, if I, these two adversarial examples, my object detector said that there was no car there. So it's an adversarial example for object detector, right? But only one of them actually caused my control loop to actually break. The other one did Because some other logic in the control loop, maybe the LiDAR or somebody picked so the idea is the adversarial examples is this big space. Only a small subset of those actually cause the car, car to crash, and we want to find those. And this is where a lot of the work I think should be going, but uh, the, the, a lot of the machine learning work is still in that other space. Now there is a lot of work uh, going on, mostly uh, from the Berkeley folks, where what it does is if you can find semantic adversarial examples and retrain your object detector, it gets more robust. Okay, so there was a paper by H. Kai uh, by uh, Tomas. <coughs> so if we can generate more semantic adversarial examples and then retrain the object detector, it will get robust to a lot of these kinds of issues. Okay, I don't know how much time I have. How much time do I have? Ten minutes. Okay. So this is what. Uh, let me. Let me. Yes. Yes. Questions. Uh, so this is what I'm going to spend a little bit of time, and then we'll open up for questions. Uh, so this is the big problem that we are looking at. Can we generate adversarial examples that matter, like cause your control loop to actually fail, the car to break, rather than just you know make a cat cat a clock of all these. So what we're going to do is use this uh, framework of compositional falsification, uh, which is, uh, and you can formalize as follows. So you're given a formal specification of your entire control group, and you have the uh, actual uh, CPS model plus some ML model. So think about that control loop that you have. You have the entire control loop in the machine learning model. And basically, all you want to find is counter examples. So find the input for which the model does not satisfy some property. This is called a compositional falsification because you don't want to actually compose all the components in the model and then do some model check. So the big problem here, so uh, I don't know whether people here have uh, looked at the CPS things like reach and so on. Those tools, there are tools out there that do composition for falsification, but they don't handle ML models. Okay. So here is my, so like a, you know, remember that control loop that I had as a machine learning system? How do you handle that? So, okay. Here are two, two sort of things you can do. A machine learning model is a program. Most of the time it's a loop-free program. And I just shove it in my model and let my abstraction refinement, or abstract refinement, <coughs> whatever handle it. I mean, it's just, it's not even, there's no loops. Like if you look at a feed forward network, there's no loops. Like, uh, 
unless you go to some other sort of models. So I just treat it as a program, and now we know how to do all that. So you just let your normal techniques handle it. Um, I don't, I, at least I, I haven't seen people try it, but I don't think it will work, because the number of parameters of these DNS is going up every, every year. So for example, Google is now talking about billions of parameters for the DNS. Okay? And uh, so I, I haven't, but maybe somebody can try to take Inception D3 and just try to verify its problem. So for example, all those verification techniques that I talked about work with very small networks right now. Okay. Maybe somebody can prove me wrong, but I don't need to prove. The other idea is that what I do is I know adversarial examples can be generated. So once I have an adversarial example, I feed it back. Now the machine learning model is gone because I know it's a counter example for that. Then I use tools like reach to find to handle the rest of it. That doesn't work because adversarial examples at the ML model are not adversarial examples at the full loop model, and then you will generate a lot of spurious work. So I don't think that's what worked. This one we did test. So we are stuck. So more and more control loops in cyber-physical systems are using machine learning models. And a lot of the tools that people put out there, like, you know, Sunday through and so on, cannot handle these big machine learning models. So they do some ad hoc things. So this is the big thing. How do you verify systems? which have machine learning components in them, and they're getting larger all the time. OK, so abstraction is the key. Uh, so for example, in this case, what you want to do is uh, you have an end-to-end -end system in this kind of uh, signal control logic. It basically says that the distance between the ego breaker and the environment object is above a certain threshold. And you want to generate trajectories that not doesn't satisfy that one. Okay, so any any ideas? How would we handle? So imagine imagine this problem. You can without this you can handle and generate computational counterexamples. How will you handle the method? <coughs> the method is believing that it works. Yeah, but I. Most example do not work in one case out of five or four. Yeah. And they choose to problem anyway, it doesn't matter. So, so here, if, if, if the loop is very fast, then maybe you will be wrong one time out of a thousand, and they will say we don't care. Yeah, yeah. but I think, like, at least the, the autonomous guys do care, right? I mean, they have, can, like, if that one thing happens out of 10,000, then actually in real life it might happen more over a year of sort of service. So I think this is something I can tell you that people do sort of, like how do you verify systems that have ML things in them? And I think you pointed the right way that the correctness for the ML folks is different than the correctness for the formal methods folks. Right? I mean, the ML guys will have a generalization error. So no. One over, we have an accuracy of 99%, we are not. But the idea is that maybe that one person that mislabeled matters for this, this thing. And that's what we are looking at. Yeah, but then they will claim that uh, they kill one person with uh, automation, but you want to kill 100 in the same circumstances, so they are better and they don't care. They, they are fake arguments, I think, that are not really logical. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I agree, I agree, I agree. Their, their, their logic is statistics and optimization rather than first order logic, right? I think that's, there's a mismatch uh, there. But regardless, like, I, at least from the car company's point of view, they do care. I have seen that, you know, like Sanjay does a lot of work with Georgia, I do some work with Tesla, and they do care. So this is what we want to do. We don't want to have a, oh, and the other thing is, uh, I was talking, giving this talk uh, at, at our department, and Tom Rep said, oh, why don't you write a specification of this machine learning model? Like, you know, with some logic. The problem is, 
these machine learning models are literally out there, like YOLO, squeeze that, these are, these are object detectors out there. And they actually use them, the car manufacturers actually use these object detectors as is, as it's on the web. So I, I don't know what a specification would mean for these things, okay? So this is one technique that I think will, uh, and, uh, let me give you an intuition that I will stop. Uh, this is a very nice intuition. Actually, this is Tomaso's uh, intuition. I'm going to, in some world, and I'm not going to get into detail, I'm going to amuse you, assume that my ML model is perfect. It always classifies it as a car. And this figure basically says that if my ML model is always uh, correct, this red space says when there is a counter. Now notice that if my ML model is always correct, then the counterexample is because of other components in my <coughs> ML model was perfect. ML model is God at this point. God tells us when there is a God. So this is like an optimistic abstraction. What I always assume there is a pessimistic abstraction, which is ML model is always wrong. If there is a God, it says it is in a car. If there is no God, it says it is. Okay, and in that world, pessimistic abstraction, this red space says when you have a counterexample, and the green space says when you don't have a counterexample. This is, think about a picture space. I, I put those two figures together. <coughs> this yellow model, yellow space is what I care about, right? Because if the ML model was right, and there was a counterexample. It's somebody else's problem. I don't care. But and if the ML model was wrong, then this basically says that if there's a misclassification in this space, then that's what matters. Other doesn't matter. And so given this sort of, it's almost like subtracting optimistic abstraction from pessimistic abstraction that gives you a small feature space and then I only have to worry about the ML model in that feature space. That is the basic idea that sort of we use to get a smaller state space for the ML model. I mean, the, so the way, very simple thing is, if the ML model is always, and, and this is what we want to kind of, uh, this, is, this is a way to probably handle the ML model. I will, using this, we were able to generate some examples which actually cause the car car to crash, or at least car to simulate model to crash. Now, I will leave you with a challenge problem. Remember there is a very small set of feature space that matters, that yellow one. Can I train models that somehow tell the machine learning model that, hey, other misclassifications don't matter, but if you misclassify that yellow region, your cost is very high. Because right now they don't do that. So, can we design loss functions that are actually informed by these sort of verification tasks and then make the, 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 the object detector more uh, sort of uh, uh, robust? Okay, sorry I was rushing towards the end. As I said, um, it's a very exciting area. Several, several workshops are coming up. Vijay Ganesh, for example, had a workshop at Waterloo combining machine learning verification and so on. And there are a lot of benchmarks and software out there. Please sort of get involved. I mean, I think this is a this problem is not going to.